Okay, I think we are ready to start. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paige Jarvey, Global Marketing Assistant with PMMI. On behalf of PMMI, I want to thank you for joining the webinar today. Uh, today, our webinar is a series of webinars that we have planned for this year to help PMMI members grow their export sales. Uh, in a few short moments, we'll hear from Anon. Uh, sorry for the pronunciation. I'm kind of bad, but uh, Hamini, uh, he's the managing partner at Indobras Consulting, um, and Anand will be presenting the updated findings to PMMI's report uh, from 2015, Brazil's Competitive Intelligent Report, uh, and you can find out other events um, that we have going on, like the events and services for the upcoming show in Brazil, FISPAL, um, you can find those at pmmi.org forward slash global. Um, let's see here. Um, quickly before we start, um, some of the events and services that we have uh, at CISPAL, we will be hosting a lunch um, which Anon will actually be joining us for. Uh, it's on Wednesday, July, or excuse me, June the 15th at 10.30. Uh, at the uh, PMMI Pavilion booth, so 178I. Um, and there, again, you'll be able to meet Anon and hear more details on what's going on in Brazil. We also do have the Brazil Agent Directory available as well if you're attending um, something you might be interested in. The Brazil Agent Directory will give you information you need uh, to connect with Processing and Patrick packaging machinery agents, distributors, and reps in that target market. Uh, also, don't forget that at PMMI's Pavilion, again, booth 178i, um, we do offer uh, complimentary services, uh, as you can see here, interpreters, meeting rooms. Uh, we also have internet stations, um, a lounge area. So if you have um, some time, stop on by. Dolores um, will be there from PMMI. Uh, she'd be happy to uh, say hello or answer any questions you may have. Um, let's see here. Following uh, up, uh, or excuse me, following this webinar, I will send uh, a follow-up email um, if you're interested in any of the events at FISPOL. If you're attending, um, they'll be listed there, and you can. Um, register for the lunch or, um, you know, answer or ha if you have any questions, you know, I'd be happy to answer those for you. Uh, as I said, Anand, he is with Indobras Consulting. Uh, he's here to help us tap into uh, the growing questions and opportunities in Brazil. Uh, Anand has extensive experience in analyzing the packaging machinery and capital goods sectors in Brazil. Uh, and he's conducted many, many reports over the years, 15-plus um, years, I should say, uh, for PMMI members. So he uh, is going to, again, present those findings to us. Uh, and the report is also available to download online at PMMI.org. Again, that will be in the email when I follow up after the webinar. Just quickly, a few housekeeping items before I turn the presentation over. I do want to bring to your attention that the webinar you have entered is on muted mode. Uh, if you have any questions that you would like to ask, please answer, or excuse me, please type them in in the chat box uh, on the left-hand corner there. And at the end of the presentation, we'll go through and answer any questions um, you may have. So without further ado, Anon, I uh, present this presentation over to you. Uh, let's see here. Anand? Hey Paige, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, uh, good afternoon everyone. Um, the idea today is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to run you through uh, the presentation slides very briefly and hopefully be, you know, as interactive as we can be, um, you know, with, with Q&A. I tend to, uh, you know, follow, uh, you know, Jack Welch's maxim that, you know, anything over 12 minutes uh, becomes a, a monologue that everyone sort of clicks out of. So I'll try to keep my, my, my commentary short. Uh, there is obviously um, a lot of uh, additional commentary 
in the notes section of the slides once you do download the uh, presentation. And obviously, uh, the report is available for everyone. So I'm not going to get into the weeds of the details of the reports, but I'm going to try to extricate some of the more um, sort of the more macro issues, some of the more strategic issues, and hopefully be able to answer questions for everyone. Um, so if, uh, if you know, without further ado, let me let me let me let me run into uh, the first slide, which is essentially an introduction of Brazilian macro macroeconomy. Now, many of you, I, I noticed that uh, that you know have already participated in FISPAL and and are folks that we we've uh, you know that that have spoken. Uh, the, you know, we've we've had a few exchanges, and uh, you may remember that about two years ago, on one of my presentations at uh, at FISPAL, it was at a restaurant. I said. Gentlemen, ladies, Brazil is not for the weak of heart, um, and you know, said and done, right? I mean, this has been the most wildly fluctuating currency in the world over the last four years, right? So I'll say that again. I mean, it's been, you know, it's been the largest number of standard deviations from the mean um, in any given month for the last three and a bit years now. Uh, which makes planning impossible, right? Especially if you're exporting into the country or if you're um, servicing the country with uh, you know, either after-sales technical support services or spare parts. It really becomes very, very difficult to um, you know, price your products and, uh, and obviously you know, becomes very, very difficult to maintain a price once you've, uh, once you've given a quote uh, because it, you know, three months later when your client decides that he wants to purchase it, their uh, their costing has gone you know up or down very significantly, so I want to I want to you know I want to stop there for a second and tell you you know a little bit about how these macro factors affect um, PMI members and and other capital good uh, you know manufacturers that we work with down here, um, and what uh, what we see um, you know a lot of folks doing to uh, to offset or to mitigate this uh, this this you know crazy currency fluctuation so. Uh, you know, Brazil's moved from you know 156 in 2010 all the way out to 371. You know, it hit 412 earlier um, in the year, and now it's back down to about 360. Um, you know, 359, 360. So you know, you're looking at a pretty major exchange rate devaluation. So you know, obviously, the the manufacturing sector in the U.S. Um, has gotten pretty badly affected, you'll see this in the, uh, in the import numbers, uh, you know, a few slides down, um, because in, in, in Riai's terms, um, in our local currency terms, everything imported has become short of prohibitive, has become that much more expensive. Um, so here, you know, we've had um, a few different strategies that we've seen clients adopt. One is try to put together long-term currency hedges. The, you know, and that, that works for, you know, people that are working on a hedge for quote to delivery, you know, three months. Anything over three months in Brazil is prohibitive. You know, your, your banks are charging you for, you know, 4.5% for, uh, you know, hedging the currency one way and then another 2% hedging the currency the other way. So, you, you know, your, your, your total cost just to hedge your currency has become upwards of 6% for 90 days, right? So here... You, you, you've got a situation where you know it may work for those of you that are fortunate enough to have phenomenal margins, uh, but for the most of us that work on tighter margins, it's 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 not really been an option. So what's happened um, is that you've got a situation in Brazil which ha which couples you know inflation with a reduction in consumer spending and you know GDP growth in in general. So you've had a you know. Uh, the, the, the government, I think, fudges the numbers here a little bit but, uh, over the last three months, but my view is that you have real unemployment at about 16 or 17 percent. The government is issuing uh, numbers of 11 percent, which is not true, because you have, you know, similar to the state, you have just sort of the underemployed, which are just not being counted, and then you have the people that are on welfare that are not being counted. So, you know, it's anywhere between 17 to 19 percent. And, you know, what, what, what's that meant? The me that's meant that, you know, consumer spending for the first time in, in over the last 14 years has actually gone down in Brazil, um, which means that, you know, you're going to see the aftermath in the, in, the, in the packaging sector. The other thing that's happened is that um, because of the consumer spending uh, reduction, you've had a significant reduction in industrial activity. You know, we're looking at uh, an 11 percent reduction on, uh, when you compare May of this year to May of last year. 
So it's, it's a very significant industrial um, activity reduction. Commerce has only gone down by about um, you know 0.5 percent, and um, you know so, so so sort of services and commerce are still relatively you know relatively speaking um, unscarred with um, with the GDP uh, reduction. So you, you you're you're looking at a GDP reduction of three and a half percent to four percent cumulative. So you know. Uh, this year and last year, so you're looking at an 8% GDP reduction over over two years. And while a lot of the economists are, you know, talking about a V-shaped recovery, um, you know, yours truly here doesn't believe that. There's there's many underlying fundamentals which uh, which lead me to that conclusion. The first one being that the the level of indebtedness at the public sector and at the listed company private sectors is at a high at, at an all-time high and you know notwithstanding this you have the consumer spend this consumer indebtedness at an all-time high so you know a v-shaped uh, recovery seems a little um uh you know for lack of a better term just overly optimistic um so you know i, w I won't i won't dwell into um you know some of the more um Silent political issues in Brazil because I could, you know, probably write a PhD thesis on this at this point. But suffice to say that, you know, any of you that have not been um, accompanying uh, what the New York Times now coins as the largest single corruption uh, scandal in the history of its coverage, um, you should just Google, you know, Petrobras corruption and you'll get everything you need. But uh, What's happened is that you know the, the public sector is completely discredited, um, and they're fumbling through policies that seem to be, you know seem to backtrack half the time. So you're looking at a, a muddling through period for the next two years as, as, as we have this interim government in place. Um, you know, for those who, who are not aware, you know, the, 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 the president Dilma has been impeached. Not yet, she's been removed from office for 180 days. Um, after which she will most likely be impeached, and her vice president, who is equally, um, you know, excuse my language, as corrupt and as, um, you know, as as uh, involved in all this stuff that uh, she's being accused of uh, as a baseline for her impeachment, is now, you know, the incumbent uh, or you know the interim uh, president. He's put together a pretty decent uh, cabinet in terms of, uh, you know, an infrastructure uh, ministry as well as an economic and uh, central bank uh, 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 team, but there's they just have too much to, to 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 get fixed in a Congress that's not voting, you know, for anything other than you know themselves. So I've written a little bit about this in the um, in the in the political part of this um, this this update that we that you you, sh you should have access to. But it's it's going to be a difficult couple of years. Um, I don't see Brazil recovering as quickly as some of the uh, you know the Goldman Sachs uh, analysts and the you know Bank of America analysts are saying. And um, I'll I'll be very happy to be wrong. But uh, I think that we need to brace ourselves for another at least eight quarters of uh, of a muddling through process. All right. So what does this mean? Um, you know, for us that are trying to sell equipment in the country or um, do business in the country. The first thing it means is obviously that, you know, it's become, it's going to stay that much more expensive to do business down here because of the exchange rate. We don't see this exchange rate, you know, heading back down towards, the, you know, the, the, the 2.5 to 3 uh, reais per, per dollar. Um, so we need to be aware of that, and we need to be aware of the fact that, you know, there's a lot of um, uh, local industrial renaissance, if you would, um, folks that are just being able to meet local demand with an inferior quality product, but for you know, but price and reais. So it's getting difficult to compete if you are importing 100% of your value add in the country. Um, obviously, there are exceptions. Several of, uh, of, you, of you are aware that you know um, only you guys can make your product at that speed and that at that um, at that technical capacity, um, and you know, several of the Brazilian multinationals and, uh, um, uh, you know, local companies will only buy your product. Um, so I've, I've outlined a couple of strategies for, for you, which I'll get into. But, f you know, for, for those that are still, um, you know, trying to compete against, uh, you know, European vendors um, and, um, and, 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 you know, sometimes Chinese, um, you now have, you know, real competition from the Brazilian um, uh, companies that you need to look at. And that's something that you have to really address head on. Um, 
some of our clients and our, our, our folks that we're, we're, uh, we're advising have uh, started to either acquire companies down here or, or um, do you know, third-party outsourcing of non-key components, which means that you know, they, they, they're, they're, they're putting together, um, in, in a loose term, you know, SKD or CKD um, assembly uh, options in Brazil so that at least some of the value is locally sourced bringing the overall product to the end client, um, you know, a little bit, uh, a little bit lower. So, um, you know, we, we, we need to, we need to uh, obviously, it, this is a, it's not a one-size-fits-all, but um, I'm going to outline a few of these strategies in a little bit. Um, one of the things that you'll see is that, you know, the packaging, um, if you look at the next slide, it, you know, it breaks out packaging um, equipment uh, that's been imported by country over the last two years. So you'll see that there hasn't been an, uh, you know, a very, very significant reduction in, um, in, in uh, uh, overall uh, dollars and cents. You will see a larger reduction this year uh, because uh, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, these, uh, these, these sales are usually programmed. And uh, what, when, what we're seeing now is that uh, people that have actually made purchasing decisions are stalling. Uh, you know, last year, uh, people were still, um, you know, uh, I guess, less bearish on the country's upside. Uh, people, uh, and then when I say people, I'm talking about, you know, sort of uh, decision makers at larger companies, family-owned companies that are buying equipment, are, are basically taking, okay, look, let me take a wait, let, 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 let me pause here, let me see what's going to happen. Even if I do have the demand for this, I'm going to make, you know, I'm going to wait for six months. And the six months are now becoming a year. So there's a lot of pent-up demand that's being generated. However, you don't have a lot of effective, you know, uh, purchasing happening right now, with notable exceptions, which we get into over, over, you know, uh, which is sort of the very, very high, uh, the upper end of the spectrum, the, uh, the, the, the top 10 companies in each of the pharmaceutical, food, beverage, and personal care sectors are acquiring um, equipment. They're acquiring them uh, because, you know, uh, almost counterintuitively, and this is important to note, they're just gaining market share because the, the smaller guys, the, me, the medium-sized um, uh, companies that cater to consumer uh, are, are just going out of business. They're not able to compete given the very, very high cost of capital. Um, as you, you, know, you, you, you would have noticed on, on slide number, uh, I guess, four, I, I, I've got a little slide there on how expensive capital is right now. Um, you're looking at real rates of interest at over 10 11% a year. Um, and, um, you know, that, that makes, you know, in, investments and in planning for the long term for a medium-sized company prohibitive. So uh, getting back on, on, on track here, when you look at the, the machinery imports, you, you still see a pretty interesting um, uh, trend line where you do have um, uh, imports increasing from Europe. Unfortunately, they're reducing from the U.S. And, and, and the report that we've written breaks out the why. Um, I think the European vendors have been a lot more, um, uh, a, they've been better partners for the Brazilian companies. Um, you know, and, I, and when I talk about partners, I'm talking about you know, they've been able to extend credit terms. They've been able to flexibilize payment terms. And they've been able to um, source a lot of their equipment locally allowing for um, the, the, the imported components to maintain with an existing installed base. I, 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 just, I just played that back in my head, and that, that, that may have sounded a little bit complicated. Let me, let me, let me make sure that, 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 that you guys understand what I, what I was referring to there. The Europeans have really been much more aggressive about going after the entire installed base um, of their equipment and pushing their after sales or their after um, uh, market sales for spare parts, et cetera, by offering terms, almost anticipating the fact that these are going to be years of, you know, uh, difficulty for the Brazilian, uh, for the Brazilian clients. So they've, they've assisted the Brazilian clients in, you know, revamping existing machinery, improving velocity of existing machinery. They've, 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 they've had a little bit more of a service mentality and a financially um, you know, a credit, and, 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 you know, in terms of credit terms, they've been a lot more uh, lenient with Brazilian uh, uh, vendors. And there, there are a lot of case studies that we, that we go into into the report. I won't get into that now during this webinar, webinar but I'll, I'll happily discuss it with you guys individually here at FISPAL. Um, 
but uh, so so just you know moving on, um, we have you know uh, uh, something that's also quite interesting is is the export of Brazilian of Brazilian equipment, ma you know packaging equipment has begun to make a comeback. You know, um, obviously this is this is aided by the foreign exchange, which obviously favors exports. But it's also um, largely due to the fact that the Brazilian manufacturing base has now, you know, is now a lot more profitable um, because they are they're able to you know substitute out some of the imported equipment down locally, and they've been able to get global contracts. You know, I've got uh, you know a couple of friends that uh, that, that own packaging equipment uh, companies down here, and they have uh, you know uh, recently. Signed on, you know, uh, multi-million-dollar contracts with the likes of Procter and Gamble, um, and uh, Olam, and uh, uh, Unilever for countries like Malaysia, um, you know, uh, the U.S., Canada, China. So you know, you've got Brazilian equipment now being exported out. Um, this is good and bad for you guys because you know the, the bad is obviously you got you got stronger competition. The good is that you have better competition, right? Folks that are not, you know, out there. You know, evading taxes or or doing things in a way that just uh, make make them more competitive, but through incorrect channels. Uh, remember, to be an accredited exporter in Brazil, you need to have you know your 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 audited balance sheets and stuff. So you have better better competition. You also have better potential partners in where where in which you could purchase. Um, you know the the you know uh, as a as a as an investor in banking friend of mine tells me is that you know. Uh, Brazilian companies are so cheap right now that we can go and buy them with our credit cards. Um, you know, you, Brazil is cheap. You know, uh, if you're if you're looking to purchase companies, this is the time to do it. Um, and as long as you know you're you're, you're not expecting a V-shaped uh, return, as I as I rightfully as I as I said earlier on. But um, you know, whether you're going to be purchasing these companies or even just manu you know outsourcing some manufacturing to these companies, um, it's an interesting um, it, it's an interesting new development that we've observed over the last couple of years. Okay, so that's the backdrop, um, and I've spoken for a lot longer than I wanted to speak on the backdrop. So I'm going to be uh, efficient with your time over the next three slides, which is uh, four slides, which I want to really zero in on. Which are okay. So what does you know? What does this mean? Let's let's establish some maxims here. Maxim number one, and I'll just read these. Brazil's economy is fragile, and the exchange rate is highly volatile, which favors local production when you compare that to imports. Number two. Consumer verticals that cater to packaging equipment remain agnostic to the deeper rooted macro factors because, you know, Brazil's 220 million people with, you know, according to the World Bank, the best demographics in the world. So you still have a lot of young people that are still picking up the slack for, you know, consumer spending, right? So while consumer spending is is not unscarred, you're you do have a a, a, a business here with local companies that are exporting. So, you know. Companies that are in the agribusiness, in the pharma business, in the in the um, consumer product business in general, whether it be you know food and beverage or um, personal care, they're all exporting consumer products out of Brazil, not only to Latin America but to the U.S. and to Europe and to Asia, um, and obviously to Africa because Brazil Brazil has has had a you know a historically a very very deep rooted connection with Africa. Because of the way that the, the the you know some of the African continent was developed by the Portuguese, Brazil was developed by the Portuguese, the Portuguese-speaking nations there. So you'll notice a lot of Brazilian you know cosmetics um, are you know the equivalent of L'Oreal and you know uh, um, sort of uh, the, the the higher end cosmetics, uh, European cosmetic companies um, that we perceive. The Brazilian cosmetic companies are perceived as the higher end stuff in Africa and in parts of Asia now as well. So. You know the consumer verticals. Yes, they have taken a little bit of a hit, but they. But you look at the numbers, and you will see that they are not actually taking as much of a hit because Brazilian companies are using the exchange rate to export, which means that they need the capital goods to uh, to to enhance their production. Now, uh, the, the maximum number three, and this is this is, this almost drives the entire conversation, is you know imported goods are only really competitive in higher end niches, right? Um, there's a natural tendency now to source locally. You know. Everyone, um, you know, every single Brazilian, you know, uh, manufacturing company is looking to source locally. Um, so we, 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 we've, we, you know, looked at a couple of different options. Uh, we've, we've uh, tried and tested a few of these, and I wanted to talk to you about three of them that, you know, I think a lot of you already, 
you know, uh, in the process of doing. If you haven't done so, um, you know, be happy to speak to you further. But you know, one is look, there's something in the in, there's something that called the XRE file. I'll get into it in a second. There's there's you can structure a local limited liability company, or you can you know outsource you know um, assembly you know slash purchase a company. Um, to go into the first of the options, which is you know it's it's almost a no-brainer. It's it's predicated on the fact that only uh, that 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 there's no Brazilian manufacturer that can make your equipment. So if you can, if, if you are confident of that, you can basically apply for something that's called the ex tarifario. It's a simple process. It takes three to four months to get through, but basically you, you enhance your competitive note locally by reducing the import duty. You know, for the most part, you guys are, are, are your, your harmonized code rate will, will, will yield the import duty of 14%. However, you still have IPI, which in some cases is 8%, ICMS, which is 18%, which is a state value added tax, and then you have fees and cofines, and these are all vested cumulatively on the import duty. So when you apply for an ex tarifario, you actually reduce your import duty from 14 to 2%, but you're, so it's not really a 12% reduction. It's a reduction that would be closer to 15 to 16% um, because of the cumulative taxes that go on after that. So this is something that you know a lot of our clients are doing. It's um, it's you know it's 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 not um, it, 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 it's it's the, the only the only thing that you need to be aware of is that each product needs one. So if you're you know if you're one of the companies that you know have you know 18,000 SKUs in terms of equipment, um, this is not going to be a solution for you. Uh, but if you have you know one you know hot seller that you sell you know X off a year. Um, you're going to be able to reduce that cost to your end customer by about 15% when all, when all is said and done if you apply for this thing, um, you know, and, uh, and, and, and get it approved, which is, as I said, about a three- to four-month process cycle. Um, you've got to get some of your brochures and, 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 and spec sheets translated and, and basically apply for it. Um, you have your distributor apply for it or apply, you know, have even your end client apply for it. The, 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 the thing, the little known thing here is that it's not only the person or the entity that applies for it that, that can import it for that, um, that, with the duty exemption. It is also for any other company that wants to import that equipment. So it's, the, the x tarifario is granted to the equipment and to the vendor, meaning yourselves, not to the applicant. And that's something that, you know, I, I've noticed that there's a lot of confusion when I speak to people about this. So I just want to make that, that, that very, very clear. Um, so, you know, that, that, that's an option. It's an option that, 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 you know, doesn't require very, very much. I mean, these, these things usually get done in about five to $6,000, uh, um, you know, depending on, uh, on, on the complexity of the, uh, the equipment at hand. But it, it's, not, it, it's not an expensive proposition uh, depending on, uh, you know, what your volumes look like. Um, the second, uh, the, the second thing that you know, a lot of the companies have been doing. And this is this is something that you know, the large, larger manufacturing companies like you know, uh, you know, Coca-Cola and GM and Ford and Volkswagen have been doing in, in Brazil for the last uh, you know whatever four decades. Um, it's just establishing a local entity because you can you can transfer price your equipment into your local entity and then sell to the market and you can remit your profits as dividends, and those dividends are tax-free. So you can do this. It, it takes a little bit of you know, legal setup to get done right, but it's, um, it's not something that you'd want to do unless you have recurrent revenue here. Uh, this is not you know, a one-off sale. It's not something that you know, if you've got a couple of different you know, sales, uh, um, leads in Brazil that you would do because maintaining this costs money. It'll, it'll, it'll cost you anywhere between three to $5,000 uh, you know, uh, a month sorry, uh, just to maintain an entity here that's trading. Now, um, you know, you can do it for a little bit cheaper uh, if you outsource back office and accounting functions. We, we've done that for a lot, of our, uh, a lot of clients. But the point is that you don't want to do this unless you have re recurrent revenue. Um, this is something that uh, you would be wanting to look at if you, you know, if, you, if you're looking at Brazil as a little bit of a medium to longer term play and you have either you know, recurrent revenue with spare parts or services or just have a, a, a back order um, of equipment that's going into OEMs, et cetera, that you really are confident about. Um, so I won't get into the legal jargon of this, but, you know, suffice to say that this is, this is something that takes about six months to put together. So it takes a little bit of time, um, you know, once you've actually made a decision to go ahead. Um, and you need to be aware that you're going to have a monthly fixed cost, so you, you don't want to do this unless you're certain. 
Um, the, you know, the other thing is obviously the uh, the third option is really you know outsourcing locally, uh, which which means what? Which means you know I'm going to bring you know the part of my equipment that nobody else can make uh, but myself, and I'm going to you know buy the the the, the Air compressor and the the motors and the you know the the, the you know the, the metal boxes that are not you know uh, sort of uh, part of your DNA if you would they're not part of your secret sauce you're going to buy them locally and have them assembled by you know a, a, a an accredited assembler over here in Brazil the beauty of doing this now is that you know Brazil because of the Brazilian industrial um, production being down by as much as you know 11 percent we we're, we're we've got a lot of spare capacity now so you got guys. Um, you know, folks that own companies that are that are looking for stuff like this, and uh, that are that are good, but just have had a, a you know a, a, a downtake on their on their um, on their product demand, and you know now they're looking at um, you know uh, sort, sort of utilizing their spur capacity, and I, I would take full advantage of that if you can establish the you know the the the, the structural framework in which to to do so, um, you know, and and have you know exclusive licenses and agreements that, you know, protect you from any intellectual property that you may be, um, you know, uh, uh, showing to folks that are not uh, not yourselves. A lot of the companies that have that issue, that, you know, the intellectual property um, issue, um, would either establish a local company and, and start doing that themselves here so that, you know, you're, you're, you're bringing this in locally, or um, as, as several, you know, as several of the clients have been doing lately, is just purchasing an existing company in Brazil um, having said that, I'll repeat my original, you know, thing that Brazil is not for the weak of heart, and buying companies locally here, you know, is while cheap in dollar terms today, is also fraught with with dangers in that, you know, because the economy has been so weak over the last, uh, you know, couple of years, a lot of the companies have been, you know, uh, uh, less um, efficient about paying all their taxes and um, labor, so there's a lot of contingent liabilities in in, in Looking at assets down here, uh, which you know you'd be you'd be very well um, versed to take good guidance on. Um, anyway, so those are those are those are the, some of the options, um, strategic options that we've been uh, you know we've been noticing. I've I've hit on them you know uh, perhaps not as structurally as this as, as I have now in this presentation, but I've hit on these you know a few times over the course of the last few years. Uh, where I've seen, like, you know, well, hey, company X and Y is doing this. Um, but now it's just, you know, everyone's doing one of the three things now. Um, you know, I, I see very very few companies that are not doing one of the three uh, things, and I, I would say fourth if you include acquisitions, uh, because they just realize that, look, they're, no, they're not going to be competitive in Brazil, and, you know, the exchange rate is going to be a little depreciated over, you know, over the medium term, if not the long term, I think. Um, when you look at the verticals, um, you know I've, I've outlined, you know, uh, some of the uh, the larger, the, the ten largest food companies and the ten largest beverage companies, and kind of, um, you know, uh, given a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, top line um, uh, annotations as to, you know, how these companies are doing. But you, you'll notice that, you know, um, the food the food industry in Brazil is obviously growing incredibly, but the growth is not local. The growth is for exports, and you're looking at, you know. You know, huge Brazilian nationals, right? JBS, BRF, are folks that you know have been purchasing companies in the U.S. and and, and Canada and, uh, and and across Europe and Asia, and they're just growing tremendously. If you're if you're doing business with them, you're going to be doing with them business with them globally. So they, these are these are nice, um, you know, nice clients to have uh, globally. It takes, you know, uh, from experience, and you know, we we we. You know, we have a trading arm ourselves, and we we do quite a lot of work with uh, with three of these companies. It, 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 they're they're bureaucratic to do business with, uh, but uh, you know, once you're in, you're 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 you know, you usually spec into every single bid that they uh, that they put out there. So these are these are obviously you know, the food businesses in Brazil is actually doing very very well, largely fueled by exports. Beverages, you know, again, um, you you've got a few uh, large large companies that have just been. Buying up a lot of the medium-sized companies, so it's getting, it's becoming a target. Um, you know, in terms of number of targets, it's becoming smaller. But these guys have an incredible amount of bargaining power. I'd be very, very, um, you know, just a word, of, a word to the wise is, you know, when you when you're selling to folks like Ambev, um, you got to be very careful because they're they're they extend trade terms like like nobody's business, and um, there's 
there's there's some difficulty doing business with some of these companies because of the sheer size that they've gotten to at this point. Um, having said that, you know, um, I've always been a big advocate of going to the medi the medium sized markets in Brazil. I'm 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 telling you now that you know you'd want to focus on the the top of the pyramid, unfortunately, because they're the only guys that are that are that are really doing business and buying equipment and uh, and purchasing some of these smaller guys. So it's 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 the industry's gotten a lot more concentrated, which um, which you know there's arguably is not great for you guys. Um, but um, you know the, the personal care, we you know Brazil is still growing. Um, it's also been um, very positively affected by import substitution, right? So you've got large national champions again, you know Natura, Boticario. Um, it's it's they're, they're they're doing very well. If you look at the the their revenues and you look at their asset bases, it's um, these these are these are interesting companies to uh, to get on your client rosters. Um, looking for increasing speed, you know, increasing labor substitution, um, becoming a big, big issue for these guys, you know, trying to, trying to automate, especially the end of line uh, packaging is something that uh, the personal care industry has been very, very aggressive about the last year and will be over the next year as well. Um, you know, regional expansion into the northeast of Brazil has been a big, big thing for these guys as well, you know, sort of following what's happened in the beverage, beverage sector a couple of years ago. Um, and um, well, you know, I, I, and, and pharmaceuticals. I'm not going to really talk too much about that. But you know, pharmaceuticals has, I feel, is going to be a much. Um, it, it's going to be the, the, the sector that's actually most affected by this negative GDP growth, which is almost counterintuitive when you think about it, because it should be a, a much more inelastic demand. But what I see happening is, and the media is not picking up on this yet, but you you'll see this. I'm I'm, I'm telling you what I. What, what I'm projecting is that you're going to see a, a, a reduction in um, pharmaceutical growth because the government spending, which accounts for over 40% of, uh, of the sector's spend, is going to get reduced. And, um, and, and you know, that's just, that's just inequivocal. It's, 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 it's something that's going to happen. So, you know, th those of you that are in the pharmaceutical, um, you know, catering to the pharmaceutical industry, just be aware, um, you know, there's going, to be, there, there's going to be a little bit of a shrinkage um, in, the, in, in, in the sector this year. Um, so, you know, the next few slides I'm not going to go into. This is really a summary of the end users we've interviewed and their perception of U.S., you know, European, you know, Chinese and uh, domestic um, equipment manufacturing um, pros and cons. Um, this is nothing new under the sun. This is this is uh, basically a, a brief update on what on the on the large report that PMMI had commissioned uh, from us a uh, uh, year before last, uh, or actually sorry, last year. So uh, we've already covered this in the, at the at, uh, during the last few spa on the last uh, webinar. So I won't go into this again. Uh, suffice to say that you know um, it's it's the Europeans have actually gained great gained um, ground, which is um, which is an unfortunate um, you know for the for the for the you know, for, 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 for you guys that are listening in on this uh, web, webinar, but um, it's, it's interesting to study their strategies. It's, it's, it's always nice to be able to, uh, you know, uh, copy as opposed to create. Um, and they've, they've actually been doing quite well. Um, with that, um, I've gone, wow, it's now in my clock, it's 3.40. So I have actually, you know, more than tripled uh, my 12-minute rule. And I'm going to leave uh, the monologue aside and hopefully be able to take uh, any questions that you may have Again, thank you so much for the opportunity to speaking to you, and I hope that uh, that, that what I've uh, exposed has been intelligible. Thank you, Anand. Uh, and like he said, we will open the floor up for questions. Uh, the box on the left-hand side of your screen on the bottom, uh, you are able to um, chat your questions in there, and Anand would be happy, I'm sure, to answer those for you. Um, don't be shy. I know he gave a lot of great information, but um, we would appreciate interaction from um, you, the audience here. Um, so please feel free. Uh, while we wait for questions to, oh, we won't, we won't wait. Um, question one for you, Anand, is what is your expectation on how long the economy will take to recover? Jorge, I, I'm looking at, um, you know, end of 2017, 2018. Um, there's an election uh, year um, taking place, a municipal election this year. So you'll see a little bit of an uptick on the third quarter this year, but it's not going to be anything meaningful. 
next year is going to be a muddling through year in my opinion. Um, so I'm sorry for being, you know, uh, a little bit a little bit more cynical um, than most uh, pundits or analysts, uh, but that's my take. Um, you know, 2018 would be where I would look at uh, structural growth, not not an you know on an, uh, a politically induced uptick. Okay. Does anyone else have questions? Are we thinking of questions? Are we taking a nap? <laughs> um, I will. Have, have I made everyone give? Have I made everyone give up on Brazil yet? <laughs> no, of course not. Of course not. You gave uh, great information. Oh, here we go. Um, will you be at the Fistball PMMI booth? Uh, I'm well, actually traveling that evening, so I'm 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 I'm, I'm off to uh, um, Europe. In fact, that evening, but I will be at the PMMI booth. Um, uh, during the morning time, and then during my presentation, obviously. Uh, but I'll probably have to head out to the airport at about 4 p.m. Okay. Uh, again, uh, Anand will be uh, presenting on Wednesday, um, so you will have an opportunity if you are going to uh, FISPAL to um, meet Anand and, again, uh, hear a little bit more information in depth um, let's see. We also have so, Louis, a Louis, question. In terms of the, in terms of the dollar um, um, exchange, so you know, we I, I make projections and I always make projections in scenarios, right? So my scenario, um, and and it, it's actually a little off the beaten path. Um, you know, a lot of the analysts, if you look at you know what the guys at Credit Suisse, at Goldman Sachs, at, at uh, Bank of America Merrill, are saying, they're looking at uh, a projection of 3.6, 3.7. Right, but I mean, these guys change it every you know every week. They'll change it by 20%, which makes no sense to me. So, so my scenario, um, and I'm sorry for you know bashing my investment banking friends. My scenario is 380. All right, I feel that you know Brazil at 360, which is right now, it's 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 not reflecting fundamentals. I think that you know the the, the market has overpriced in the the potential improvement of the economy because of the political um, leaders that are that are here and you know honestly I'd, I'd, I'd love it if I'm wrong um, but I'm I'm projecting 380 okay, okay. Um, and um, uh, uh, Jorge uh, the industries where I expect more export growth are going to be you know food and um, uh, personal care wonderful um, so for those that are just listening, the question is, can you repeat the industries with more export growth uh, and potential opportunities? And Anand said, personal care and food um, would be the industries where he expects more growth. Um, don't see any other questions coming in, so we'll move right along here. I won't keep anybody um, too much longer. Just quickly, uh, letting everybody else, or excuse me, letting everyone know what PMMI is up to. Um, running uh, simultaneous with FISPAL, um, PMMI will also be at ProPAC Asia in Bangkok, um, where we do also have a webinar uh, next week if anybody's interested, um, as well as you know market research and a pavilion there. We're also um, in China. Uh, Shanghai in July, um, and then further on down in the year, we are at uh, PACX India in September. Um, again, we have a lot of market research, a lot of um, different opportunities for uh, you, the members, to uh, really find a market that works well for you. Um, please feel free to email me if you have any questions or information. Um, Again, I will uh, send a follow-up email with everything that we discussed. Uh, Nan, I want to thank you again uh, for such a great presentation. Um, I'm sure everybody that's going to FISTBALL will be excited to meet you. Uh, and for our participants, uh, on behalf of PMMI, thank you um, for participating. Um, and like I said, uh, as a final note, we will, um, you'll receive an email uh, with the links to any events or the um, Brazilian report that 
Anand uh, touched on uh, if you're interested in that. Uh, there will also be an evaluation on today's webinar. Uh, it would be uh, greatly appreciated if uh, you took the time to uh, take the survey. It is no more than six questions. Uh, it will take you probably two minutes. Um, so again, if you could uh, let us know how we did. Um, you know, we asked for feedback and suggestions on that. We would really appreciate that. Um, so again, thank you, and I hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Enjoy. Um, hopefully, you guys.